Hi everybody, my name is Don Dixon and I want to thank you for joining me again today for another session of our Structure Fishing Workshop. We're currently discussing the movements of the fish. We established way long time ago that fish move about in a lake and they move about in two different ways. They, they have what we refer to as a basic movement of fish, which is referring more to the basic movements that occur during the summer months. We also mentioned that fish move about from a seasonal standpoint. And here I am with my wife today. If you were with me in the last session, you'll see we're out here on a lake today. We're on Yale Lake. Uh, it's a pretty large lake here in Central Florida. It's one of the ones that's close to my home. And uh, as I mentioned the last time we got together, uh, I'm searching for some seasonal fish, strangely enough, because that's what we've been talking about here recently. But that's what I'm doing because we have some out-of-town guests coming in. They want to catch some fish, and I hadn't been doing much fishing. So last couple of days, my wife and I have been out searching for some fish. We find a lot of fish, uh, not too many today, although my wife caught a nice one today. But uh, we found most all of our fish in their wintertime position. They're not even beginning to stage, uh, not even in the pre-spawn areas where I'd expect to find them, much less in the spawning areas. So we're, we're a little bit early, uh, although we did catch some fish. But it's a beautiful, quiet uh, end of the afternoon, so we thought we'd take advantage of it and shoot this follow-up vlog on the seasonal movements of a fish. Okay, so you could probably tell by the pink rod. My wife just actually caught this fish. I'm just unhooking it for her and she did a nice job of reeling it into 250 spoon plug still pre-spawn fish is still pretty deep they're not staging yet but nice fish baby doll good one shall i get your picture Nice job. As I mentioned the last time we talked, our study fish is a largemouth bass, and the last time we got together, we specifically zeroed in on the seasonal movements of a largemouth. I also mentioned that some of the other species, namely the walleyes, white bass, stripers, northern pike, muskie, uh, trout, and salmon, these fish are quite a bit different than the largemouth bass when it comes to the seasonal movements. We mentioned that all of those species move for quite a distance uh, when they're making their seasonal movements. And I want to specifically get at a couple of those species today. And it's the most popular sort of next to the largemouth, the most popular species I think uh, around the country today is the walleye. And because I taught buck schools up in uh, the Winnipeg River uh, every summer for 20 years, I have a lot of experience with the walleye. <laughs> Even though I'm basically a bass fisherman who had a tremendous amount of uh, love and respect for a walleye as well and, and, and had a chance to really fish them. For approximately three months every year, I fish almost nothing but walleye. Uh, so I have some first-hand knowledge for you about the walleye. They will travel long distances. Uh, I have some friends uh, in the conservation departments. I've got some records that I can share with you just to give you an example about the walleye. My conservation guys fitted about a thousand walleye with these uh, transmitters. It was in the area of the Maumee River and, and Detroit River, which is in a complete western basin of Lake Erie. And a little bit later on in the season after the spawn, a lot of these fish were monitored in the area of the Bass Islands, which is sort of towards the central basin of Lake Erie. And then later on in the summer, and they were all the way down to pretty much where I fish in the eastern basin, which is where the deepest water of Lake Erie exists. And these fish were measured almost all the way to the connecting canal from Lake Erie to Lake Ontario, which of course is in the New York state line. And when they measured the miles, it was over 300 miles. 
So when I say a walleye will move great distances, I've only experienced them moving to about 50 miles, but they will move. In fact, we know for, a sh for sure they'll move 300 miles because they've already done it. So let's look at the seasonal movements of the walleye. They begin to move towards their seasonal position, move towards the spawn underneath the ice. In the wintertime, they're on the move. If they're in the in the, these big reservoirs, or if they're in a big major river situation, they're going to start following the brake lines to the channels and start moving up that reservoir or up that river towards the headwaters. And in a lot of cases, what they're really looking for, what they really prefer is moving water. They need to get up to the headwaters where that river is entering into that reservoir or in the case of a major river like the Mississippi uh, you will have fish moving from one lock they'll move all the way up as far as they can go till they hit the next dam till they hit that next lock till they can't go any further and that's where they spawn now this spawning run as I mentioned takes place under the ice and when the ice first goes out the walleyes are already in their position where the spawning is going to take place. So we've established walleyes will move great distances to spawn. Their seasonal movement is nothing like a bass. They just take off and go and they're moving under the ice. During the winter months, they're already moving towards the spawning areas. How far they go is going to depend on the reservoir, the river system, or the natural lake they're in. And if it is a major reservoir, a large reservoir, this beginning movement, seasonal movement, will start from the lower end of the reservoir in the deeper sections of that reservoir. And they'll move all the way up to the headwaters where the stream comes in that's forming that reservoir. And many of the side, big major side feeder stream cuts can also have fish uh, splintering off and spawning up a major secondary river as well. But the moving water is a key. That's what the walleye is like and it's important to have gravel bottoms and, and sandy bottoms you know uh, to have a to have a perfect spawning situation but it's always going to be pretty much about as far as these fish can go. Now in some of the big natural lakes that we have uh, in walleye country uh, some of them are stream fed as you know and again there we have moving water and this is what those fish like. They like that moving water. Now, if your big natural lake up north, let's say in Minnesota, is not stream fed, but a landlocked lake, then we're going to be starting to look in the bays, the big bays. Uh, and again, one of the most important keys we can look for in a situation like that, since there won't be any moving water, we look at the bottom makeup. In order to have the perfect spawning situation, the bottom condition is important. We need to have gravel, we need to have sand, we need to have something like that. If it's just all muck, they're not going to be there. So you have to search out the spawning areas, but always keep in mind now, these fish will move long distances, and this is really important too when it comes to catching fish. Let me tell you a quick little story about how important the seasonal movements or the position of the fish can be if you're on a fishing trip. I, along with about... Uh, I think it was six or seven of my fishing buddies. We just took a trip. We had heard about all the big walleyes being caught out in the Columbia River and never fished the Columbia River. Uh, so we went out west, took a long trip, and we spent about seven or eight days fishing. In the first four days of that trip, we could not find the fish. They had spawned and they had started moving back down that river. And we didn't know whether they were two miles down, whether they were seven miles down, whether they were 15 miles down from the spawning area. We just didn't know. So we were searching and searching and searching. It wasn't until the fourth day we got into some fish. We got into some great fish. But that's the importance of this, at least being aware of this seasonal movement. We don't know where they are. Now we know where we catch them in the summer months and once the summer patterns begin, then it's not a problem. But during that post-spawn, after the fish start moving away from their seasonal position, it can be very, very difficult locating where they are seasonally. 
and we're going to go back to our favorite statement. We can't catch a fish if we're fish, fishing where there are no fish. And seasonally, they may not be where you're fishing. And if they're not there, you can't catch them. So keep in mind, these walleyes will move great distances. And so will the striper and so will the white bass. They're almost exactly the same. And I like to talk a little bit about the white bass because I think it's a great fish. And I think it's becoming more and more popular species. Uh, in later years, it's become quite a bit uh, more popular. Uh, and with that big tail they have, you know, they fight hard. They're, they're great fun to catch. And most of the time, when you're into those white bass, you're into bunches of them. <laughs> and it could be a real fun fishing day. So keep in mind on the seasonal movements of the white bass, they're the same way. They'll start, in fact, I did a school uh, basically on white bass up in the Mississippi River at Lake Pepin, way back in the 70s, sometime back in the 70s. But those fish would run all the way up to the lock. They run as far as the walleyes go. Now, the good news is that they move a little bit after the walleye. Walleyes first, and white bass come after. And, uh, in fact, they'll do a lot of foraging in the same areas where the walleye had, had uh, already spawned. Uh, but they will move long distances and they don't stay very long either. Once that spawn is over, boom, back down to the deeper water. That's how they do it. Uh, and I also wanted to talk about the uh, muskie and the uh, northern pike. You think about northern pike and muskie being the same fish. I always think about them the same way. Uh, I'm not changing how I fish for them and I always think of them as the same fish. However, in the seasonal movement, the northern pike is way earlier than the muskie when it comes to the spawn. With the northern pike, they're spawning normally when the water temps around 42, 44, something like that. They're early, and they are also moving under the ice, and when the ice goes off, they're already back in those bays, in those shallow water areas, and they're ready to go. And I think it must be, you know, I think it was God's way of creating this uh, sensible situation where since northern pike and muskie are almost the same critter, he decided to have the muskie spawn quite a bit later than the northern pike. That way the muskies won't be foraging on, on the, on the uh, northern pike babies. So uh, with a muskie you figure uh, 52, 54 degrees, something like that, water temp, that's when the muskies are in. Now, they're in the same areas as the northern pike, but they're spawning a little bit later than the northern, which is a good thing. Uh, it's a healthy situation for the resource, where you can have both species in the same situation and living, uh, you know, quietly together, as it were. So we have muskies, northern, moving, under the ice, they're moving, they're in position, ready to go pretty much after ice out, especially the northern, he's first, then the muskie. And the walleye, he's in position, ready to go right after ice out. And all of these seasonal movements of those fish go for long distances. Just be aware of that. So when you're looking for them post-spawn, just like a bass, I always say, uh, and Buck said, the hardest thing to do is catch a bass, uh, an adult-sized bass, post spawn. It's a difficult two or three weeks. But it's also difficult for the species we're talking about today only because they're moving such great distances we don't know where the heck they are. Let me give you another step. They put a transmitter on a striper. And they wanted to see how far this, this striper would go. And it was something like a month and a half after they released that fish with that transmitter, they found the fish in the fish. They found the fish down at the Pacific Ocean. And it had traveled, are you ready for this? 550 miles. And he did it in like 48 days. So about the time you break that down, that fish is traveling like 12 and a half miles a day. So take your favorite fish, let's say it's a walleye. And by the way, I love catching walleye, as long as they're big walleye. I like catching walleye, but I really like eating walleye. My favorite freshwater table uh, fare is walleye. 
But if you take that school of walleye, and let's say they're moving 12, uh, 12 miles a day or six miles a day or four miles a day, where are they today, the day you're going fishing? That's a pretty tough question. So just keep in mind, you have to be hunting. You have to really be hunting for those species of fish from a seasonal standpoint. We know what to do when we locate uh, where they are seasonally. We know how to go catch them at that point, but we've got to be able to locate them seasonally. Like Buck says, can't catch a fish if you're fishing where they ain't. So with all that being said, we've pretty much covered all of the seasonal movements of, of walleye, northern pike, muskie, white bass, stripers, uh, and uh, we also covered, of course, our study fish, largemouth bass. So I hope you have a better understanding of that, and uh, the next time we get together, something's come up. I've had a lot of questions, so I'm going to spend one whole discussion with you the next time we get together about really defining exactly what Buck meant when he said the home of the fish is the deepest water in your lake, the deepest water in an area of a lake, or the deepest water available. Now it sort of seems to be self-explanatory, but there seems to also be, from all the questions and emails I'm getting, some total misunderstanding or, or really the lack of understanding of exactly what we're talking about with this deep water home area. Where do all of these movements originate? Deepest water lake, deepest water in the area of a lake, deepest water available. I'm going to explain that in detail once and for all the next time we get together. So thanks for being with me today. My wife and I are going to do a little bit more fishing here before we call it a day. And uh, I want you to be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to our channel. We need you to subscribe. And we appreciate you, and we'll see you the next time.